All right, John. Jim Ross has been selling us on this Halloween Havoc, spin the wheel, make the deal. They've been hitting us over the head with the promotion of this show. And we got to watch it back. I remember watching it live, thinking that it was particularly bad. But back then when I watched wrestling, I was always looking for like the good stuff in it so that mm. I could, you know, if when my dad says, why do you watch this stuff? I'll, I could give him something. <laughs> This was a little harder, you know, outside of maybe the first two matches, this was a little bit harder to find really the the good stuff in in this show. Um yeah, you know, it was a little bit better than I expect I remembered actually of uh, certain matches. It could have been great. I think what really was a show killer was the uh, Masachono Rick Rude match. Mm-hmm. Really brought this show to a, like a a screeching halt and i think chono is seriously hurt in this match i think he's not 100 percent. i'm pretty sure 92 was a year that he hurt his neck i think it was september of 92 that steve austin game that you know kind of weird fate because he ends up hurting mm-hmm. um our own heart ends up hurting with the same move but uh, the, the 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 tombstone pile driver um, in Japan, Steve Austin hurt Masachono on that move, and you know, obviously, he continued to wrestle. I think he had, I think, he had surgery and he ended up changing his style later on. But here, I think he was just gutting it out, and I don't know if Chono really wanted to do much. There's one point in this match where Chono goes, or Rick Root comes off the top rope to the axe handle or or form, and. I don't know what the hell Chono was doing, but he moved out of the way. And, <laughs> and then Root had to like drop down to his feet and then give him like the double crisscross chop to the throat. And um, I've never seen a match where two guys are talking to each other the whole time. I mean, they're, you know, obviously, and they're obviously talking to each other if you're, you know, if you're not knowing what to look for. But like I can tell, like, you know, Root's talking to him and seeing what he can do and what's going on. And Root's also getting frustrated. And I think that just really just took the crowd out of the whole the rest of the show. Even though they did get up for Sting and, and um, Jake Roberts because they were, of course, the two big stars in the show. But um, I think it really hurt Barbarian and Ron Simmons more, really, because that's what followed this. But that was just a really bad match considering these guys that same year, Rick Rude and Masa Chono at the G1 had a great final, right? Mm-hmm. Chono won the title. So, um, I just yeah, I think the injury is just – just, I think Chono couldn't really so, do much out there. He was trying to, but – it has been really in the in the observer. Dave calls it a pinch nerve. So you may be right that mm-hmm. he's dealing with the neck already. And he said uh, he was basically saying that um, Rude was frustrated. He like this is Dave's impression, which was that Rude was frustrated because Chono wasn't the Chono that he had expected. Uh, so that that's kind of interesting because you know it's a, it's a it's a really big match for Rude, right? But for mm-hmm. Chono, his his bigger match is going to be in Japan, not necessarily in the United States. So uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, so I, I mean, I completely agree with you one hundred percent, which is that this show kind of dies at that point. But there were other things that led to that death. Now. We were told Rick Rude's going to face uh, Nikita Koloff in, in the first match, and they're going to have two matches. And then Bill Watts has to come out on TV and go, well, you know, because of lawyers or whatever he said, you know, mm-hmm. Rude got out of the match. and and But he gets to pick, you know, his own, his own guy. And, and so we're going to pick, like, the best wrestler in the whole company to face Nikita Koloff. Like, that is – that one is a little hard to take even – as a even as a pro wrestling fan, where a lot you know stuff like that happens from time to time, that felt a, not not that I have any problem with Big Van Vader wrestling on on a pay per view, but you know if you were thinking that Nikita was winning that title that night, you're like, okay, he's not really winning this match. There's no way he's gonna lose to Vader. So that that kind of if you're a Nikita fan, I'm sure that probably bummed you out. Um, you know, it's funny. I actually thought Nikita was still winning as a kid. I thought like, oh man. He's going to beat Vader and Rude's going to be pissed. And he's, you know, there's an issue there, right? Yeah. But um, I, I remember, but I, I remember as a kid, I liked this. I remember thinking, oh, my, oh man, Rude got out of another thing, right? And 
I think this would have been great too if they would have led to Rude versus Bill Watts or something mm-hmm. like that down mm-hmm. the line, which they never did. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, at least we got a great match. I thought that match was really good for the time it was. Yeah, the uh, match was the match was pretty good, and I've been pretty hard on Nikita for uh, for this time frame. But you know, he, I, I mean, the match was fine. It was probably like maybe like the third or fourth best match on the show. I don't think he really wanted to take that power bomb. No, and I think he got hurt on that power bomb. Actually, I mean, we the show after this is we're reviewing the the full show in a second on WWE Saturday Night was actually taped before Halloween. Havoc, yes, right. Yes, yes. So um, I think this is Nikita's last match in the company. I think he like I think they said like some kind of hernia. I don't know, but whatever. I think he was really messed up from that power bomb. He landed really awkward, and he was trying to like reach back, which is one thing you don't do. I don't think he's used to being the guy that gets picked Mm-mm. up in power bomb. Not so. at all. So, uh, but other than that, I thought the match was great. The crowd was super hot for it. Um, Vader looked good. Um, he looked massive. Um, yeah, he the, he had put on weight because he was hurt, right? Oh, really? Okay. Um, but yeah, she just looked massive. But he still moved. I think, God, he was hurt. Like, what was he hurt? Like an arm injury or? Well, yeah, whatever that injury was that for, that we talked broken wrist or whatever. I don't know. But he looked, he looked, I mean, he looked good. I mean, all the things looked. And I'd like crowd was just going nuts for that match, especially even like even like you and I like kids now we because we watch wrestling for all these years now. Now we now when the guy's up against a, tur- a, a ring post on the outside, the guy's charging <laughs> is going to run into it. Right. Like 99 percent of the time. Like even then, I would think people were like people were like freaking out. Like <laughs> the look on these the front row, they're like, oh, people are just crushed when Nikita just you know missed a sickle and they hit the ring post. Uh, I thought that was so cool seeing the like, those fans so passionate about it. I th- I think this crowd gets a little bit of a bad rep because they're basically rooting for the heels in the first match. But if you had Johnny Gunn who was booed in his first WCW Saturday night. <laughs> he, and 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 if unless you watch that match you have no idea who he is. And Zank is cooled off, right? So mm-hmm. so if you're rooting for baby faces, it's Shane Douglas, but the problem with Shane Douglas is he's absolutely 100% the white meat of all white meat baby faces. Mm-hmm. And so you've seen Arn Anderson before, you've seen Beautiful Bobby, you've seen Michael Hayes. Those guys are heels that you actually like. So the booking was kind of funky on this one. Yeah. And of course they're, you know, Arn is like soaking in the cheers. Mm-hmm. Like he's like, hell yeah. yeah. Go, I mean, well, that's something you don't see in today, like actually putting your ear to the crowd and going with it. And hey, he's, he's, he's just like, what the hell? They're going to cheer for me. I'm going to play into it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, yeah, this crowd, I think it, uh, what is it? Maybe, maybe it felt like a smarter crowd, right? I think Philadelphia has always been the kind of smarter crowd. And I think they've always liked, I think Arn and and Bobby have always been popular in in that in Philadelphia. So it was one of those. But I thought the match was good. Yeah, yeah I liked it. Was it. A, it was a fun six-man tag. The the opening, the like the first part of the show was good. Um, the match that was, I remember being like disappointed in it when I first saw it and I was watching as it was going, I'm like, God, this match is really damn good. <laughs> was these, uh, Barry Windham, Dustin Rhodes versus, uh, Steve Williams and Steve Austin match. But then the whole thing with the time limit draw, mm-hmm. and the, the, that, that, that's what I remember. That's what killed it. Okay. But everything else leading to that was like really freaking good. It, it was a really good match. And, you know, the, the, but the, again, the problem is, is you are promoting Dr. Death and Terry Gordy. Mm-hmm. And then you have to explain that, you know, as as, as much as you can explain that basically Terry, honest, Gordy, Terry Gordy quits, right? Yeah, he's pretty honest. He didn't show, right? And he didn't. So, I mean... I mean, other than saying he quit, he, I don't want. He wouldn't want to. He want to. We want to. He wouldn't want to heal the company. Why? Why would this guy quit the company, right? So him not showing up. I mean, he got a bear guy a little bit for doing that. So I was okay. But, with I mean, it. is it, was there a better guy to put in that match than Austin? Probably no, not. Right? I don't think so. I think I would have been. You know, the fans cheered it when he said it when when Bill Watts announced that Steve Austin would be the place where they they cheered it. So. Steve Williams and Steve Williams on the same team. Yeah, that was that was funny. Um, and the first, like I said, the first twenty 
minutes, whatever it was. I think it went to a 30 minute Broadway. I don't know if it was a legit 30 minutes, but uh, uh, Meltzer's report was that it was actually over 30 minutes, like by 30 <laughs> did seconds. It go, did it go over 30? Well, shit. Um, uh, but I thought the f- at least the first 20 were fantastic, and the finish should have been. I know I this is this is my this is my thinking. This is what I think what happened. I think Bill Watts said we're gonna have a replacement. It's gonna be Steve Austin. People are probably just gonna think Steve Austin's taking the fall, mm-hmm. right? Let's do a draw and let's do a little shenanigans, you know, to kind of keep people off their feet. But I think they should just just done with it with Steve Austin losing here. I think at his time in his career at WCW at this point, I think it'd been okay for him to lose here. And I think the match was going to be really great if they would have had a clean cut finish. I don't think people would have been disappointed who lost the fall, right? They would have just been happy they saw a great match. Mm-hmm. And you know when Dustin came and hit the bulldog, I think that should have been the finish. But a little more longer finishing sequence than what they did. I think they could have, you know, I think they that could have been a really hot finish with Dustin getting the pin, you know, or maybe even, uh, you know, or they could have, they didn't really tease a lot of uh, dissension between Barry Wyndham and Dustin Rhodes here. They well, that, that was what I was saying is, is that they really went away from that story. And the other thing they didn't mention is that Austin, you know, had been in a team with mm-hmm. Pillman and, and Pillman and Steamboat had a really fun match uh, early in the show. But, you know, the, the, because I, you know, this is all unexpected, they don't have storyline written out. So there's like no real reason why Stone Cold or Stunning Steve is, is the pick. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, he's supposed to be with Pillman, but he's really the best guy that you could possibly put there. So yes. I, I mean, I, I loved, I loved him as the pick for that match but you know going 30 is tough right like Mm. even you know even after the first 20 you're like okay the first 20 was good maybe the last 10 wasn't fantastic but still was a good match yeah i wish they would have done something where they teased a little dissension there's some kind of miscommunication probably could have been great for the finish like you know barry and dustin doing some kind of double team but you know austin moves and dustin hits barry now there's an argument there and and you know Austin tries to run up, run at him as take advantage as they're as they're being, um, you know, as they're arguing between Dustin and Barry. But they kind of, you know, shit can Steve Austin out of the ring. But then there's Steve Williams. He's gearing up for, he's gearing up to like do his big shoulder tackle to Dustin as he runs at Dustin. Barry shoves Dustin out of the way, and then Dustin, you know, uh, uh, Barry gets hit with the shoulder tackle. Dust Barry takes the big bump out of the ring, and then Austin slides back in. You know, you know, Dustin gets a big drop kick to Steve Williams, knocks him out. Now it's Austin and Rose, and they have a little hot interaction, and all of a sudden, boom, the big bulldog, one, two, three. Like, that would have been fire, man. Like, something like that would have been cool to see at the end. I wish they would have had this nice finish. I think I think we would have been rocking and rolling here. But um, but then we, you know, unfortunately, the match after that was the rooted Masa here at Chono. But yeah. You know, was, you know the rating Meltzer gave on that match? The uh, tag match? No, no, no. The um, the Mount Masachono match. Mm, well, it was probably should be one of his infamous duds, right? <laughs> negative three stars. <laughs> wow, geez, there's a negative scale. I know it's <laughs> just that dud was as worse as you get. Uh, he doesn't he doesn't really do negative s- stars anymore. So that that, that one just, kind of made, made me he laugh. Just, he was just probably irritated. Um, what do you think of uh, so, Barbarian and Ron Simmons? Um, kind of the things that, that we were a little worried about going into it, like, is Barbarian a contender? Is he, you know, Ron Simmons has to have what, what is, you know, a world title match? Like, is he, is he going to have that kind of match with someone like the Barbarian? And, and no, he didn't though. If you were to tell me that, you know, Ron Simmons and Barbarian could just go out there and slug it out and have like this, you know, two gigantic dudes have a match, if there was no world title at stake, I'd have been like, oh, this was totally fine, you know, heading into uh, as a match on the show. But with those stips and, you know, Barbarian did not feel like a number one contender uh, that a lot of that had to do with his previous part of his career, though. Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it was it was it, I don't think it was even as explosive as it could have been. So I, I was sort of like, eh, it was okay. But then when you add the, you know, this is for the world title, then it kind of brings it down a little bit. I think it, it got really hurt by the 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 stench of the Rick Rude, Masahiro Chono match. Um, I think they, they worked hard to 
get a reaction. They finally got a reaction when, you know, when you actually protect something, when it happens, it gets reaction. When when uh, Barbarian went up to the top to hit the missile bolt headbutt, mm-hmm. when he hit it, people rumbled. Like, oh, dude, you know, like they, 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 they in those last couple of weeks, they got that move over. And it was, you know, when Simmons kicked out, they, 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 they get a good reaction to that. So um, I think they just, I think the fans were just, just deflated after that, that, Rude and Chiona match. I think it took a while to get into it. They got they got into it towards the end, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I think I think that was the issue with that match personally. But also, I don't think anyone really, really was obviously didn't think Barbarian was winning. But I think they they did they had a match a good match laid out personally. I think they they think they probably should have started off a little hotter with. I mean, I know they, they wanted to be even. You know, guys both close on each other. No one's giving an inch. Shoulder tackles. No one's giving an inch. Maybe it should have been more of a brawling all over the kind of ring and then maybe even into the stands kind of thing. Not like ECW, but, you know, over the guardrail, you know, a little bit just to get the fans up because of what just happened. <laughs> you know, the previous match, uh, I think he kind of had to throw an audible like, hey, we got to do something hot here to get this back mm-hmm. into it because they just saw a stinker. Yeah. And then main event, Sting and Jake, which, you know, Jake is really smoking mirrors at this point. He is gigantic promo he is presence he is uh you know not uh, gonna have a great match inside the ring though he'll have a smart match and they handicap the hell out of themselves with this coal miners glove match where in order to get this coal miners glove thing you had to climb mm-hmm. a post that looked like it was like six or seven <laughs> feet in the air and the only way Sting was able to get this thing was he literally had to climb the pole like we used to have to climb in junior high school. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. he jumped on that thing. He was struggling to get up there. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking like, Jake is pretty tall, but how the hell is Jake going to climb this pole to get this <laughs> glove? Like there's no way. I would what say. What a ridiculous like stipulation for that. I would say obviously for ever since I first saw that, you know, the disappointment of the match tip, right? But rewatching it, it wasn't a bad match. It was a bad finish. The, the finish match, sucked. The match itself leading up to that point was really well done. Obviously, you know, you know, Jake is such a smart worker. You know, smart smart match makes it, it makes a great match in my opinion. They have really good chemistry together. Like they really worked well together. Jake is heavier and they really kept it short and crisp i thought the psychology was great i mean as much we crap on the coal miners glove match like when sting shimmied up that pole people were popping they were on their feet they were it, they, that was a big reaction it wasn't like they were like upset about was you know, they were into the match it was just that damn cobra spot and Sting's awkward punch, you know, that led to the Cobra. I know. We're, we're, that's where just that's that's like the, the exact point where this match. So, so, so the whole the whole took a shit. reason is the person who gets this glove can use it, and Sting punches Jake while Jake is turned around, mm-hmm. not even facing him because Jake is getting his his little snake. So he's not turned around. And instead, where you get that big punch right in the face and Jake could sell being knocked out. Instead, he punches Jake like in the the leg or like in the hip or something. And then it causes the snake that that Jake is trying to handle to kind of go nuts. And I don't know if the snake was supposed to latch onto him, but he's like kind of holding it. it. And then... He, you know, he's like controlling, controlling it, and then it latches onto the face, and you know, we we see him, and then Sting pins him after that. But I, so, what were your thoughts on why they did the thing with the snake? Because Meltzer has an interesting thought in the newsletter about what Jake was actually trying to do in that moment. Well, I thought they're building to the snake's involvement, right? He hasn't used the snake at all, at least other than the, the first time he attacked. Sting, I don't even remember him using putting the snake on the job guys after matches, right? I don't think he we saw him do that. And I think he did it once, mm. like maybe the first time, to- first one of the first times he came in. I think he did. He may he maybe not have put it on the job he guy, but he may Sting. have like 
yeah. right? When he tacked him. That's where, that's where but yes. I don't remember him doing to like the job guy like he would do in WWF. Um, but I th- well, if I if I'm watching it today, like I'm like, okay, they're the I would I would believe I wouldn't kind of feel like okay, the Cobra's gonna come to the finish somehow, right? I think this is a way to do the snake stuff for this is what Bill Watts I think was going for. Like we'll do this. This will it'll, we'll do it one time and it'll mean something. But then this is when we can ban it and there's a reason for it, right? Banning all the snake stuff. Um, I just think the, the, the execution was poor. I think you know at the same time Sting gets the the coal miner's glove. You know, obviously Jake should be getting the Cobra, and as he turns to go get Sting, that's when Sting nails him right in the face. And then this, as Jake falls back, the Cobra should. Latch onto him, I'm guessing, you know, but mm-hmm. I, th- but that rib shot that Sting <laughs> did, and, and it, I, it, it was like, it was like right when that punch happened, the mashes fell apart, and then the fans couldn't, couldn't get into it, you know. All right. So Meltzer's theory was that, you know, back then, wins and losses meant a lot. Mm-hmm. And Jake, it would be his first loss. On, t- on television. And so Meltzer, he theorized that because Jake was losing, he does the stunt at the end, and the fans kind of forget that he actually lost the match. Yeah, of course. But he also said that the whole reason for Jake to lose is so that Sting wins this match. And so if, if Jake is doing that... He's actually taking away mm-hmm. for Sting's victory, which is probably like, you know, some sort of old trick, but that, you know, that, that it was more of a, like a kind of like a protecting himself kind of thing. It's it was I don't, I don't think Jake came up with this idea on his own. I mean, maybe he did, but I think it was a way because back then you when guys would lose on television, they would do things like that to protect them. Right. Mm-hmm. So they're getting a job out of Jake, but also Jake gets to, you know, you're still thinking about him at the end of the show, like, oh, I hope he survives. You know, the anti venom. Oh, they had that anti venom on hand, you know, they're talking about. So yeah, yeah. It's it's a little, you know, kind of the game you kinda of play. If I was me, if he was being a pain in the ass and obviously he's no showing how it shows and being difficult and showing yeah, up it, in, it, like he goes to rehab in like two weeks or something. Yeah, showing up drunk or whatever, high at matches. I'm not booking no damn cold Myers glove. I'm booking a cage match with Steam. Mm-hmm. Locking the Scorpion Deathlock right in the center on on Jake and saying, "Oh yeah, don't worry, man. We'll we'll definitely." But I think Jake might have been smarter and probably wouldn't show up. But I wouldn't tell him that. And so I say, "Yeah, it's a cool money. Oh, we're changing it to cage match." Well, well that so. that's what uh, Hammer Valentine did. He he mm-hmm. was he was supposed to lose to Sting. Saw that it was only a four minute match. Looked at the bookings for the rest of the TV show and was like, "Oh, I'm not on any of these shows. I'm not going to do this job." And walked out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, so. Because of this show, uh, Meltzer has quite the paragraph about this company. And then, look, both companies are way down. WWF is way down. WCW is way down. Mm -hmm. This show, actually, at least for for the early buy rate, the buy rate was good for this show. So all the stuff that they did, the intrigue was well well done because there was interest in it. But here's what he wrote. He said, Based on every imaginable criteria to judge, Bill Watts' reign thus far has been a failure. It's not just a bad pay-per-view show. It's hardly just losing some named talent with more losses to come. It's not the morale problem. It's the lack of direction. The change in philosophy has gone from going from no philosophy to even less concept of no philosophy. Nothing is being built for the future. No ideas are being built for the concept of... For a concept for a future, it's just scatterbrained 70s ideas and concepts thrown out so fast that even if they weren't outdated, which some are, and I think he's mostly talking about uh, the the racism stuff, um, they are still being grounded out in a manner which they couldn't work. Turns are decided upon, started, and then dropped in the middle. So are storylines. Characters are dropped. 
then brought back as if they weren't dropped and buried once again. Title belts are given to wrestlers who have already made it clear they are leaving the promotion for God only knows what reason. I think he's talking about Scott Steiner. And then they leave the promotion. The turns that do happen come out of nowhere with no storyline and angles that make no sense. A man is made world champion simply because of his skin color because of a mistaken antiquated notion about how that will draw black fans to pro wrestling matches, which is now beginning to set off a new low in race baiting angles. Every criticism of Titan and every way that WCW was supposed to set a new direction and a new course for this business has been exposed as a fraud. Every statement on steroids has been exposed as nothing but hot air, which was only made worse when Jim Ross spoke of the other guys having the posers. While Watts proclaimed that WCW was going back to wrestling, the real deal and needing to bring credibility back to the product on his first pay-per-view show, that he was willing to take full responsibility for because previous shows he was willing to blame his predecessors because wheels for those shows were already in motion before he got there, even though in the case of the bash, he was in charge from start to finish for all the television buildup of the show. We heard announcers talking about anti-venom, a snake chewing on a man's cheek, a string of ref bump finishes, a major no-show, the most blatant example of bait and swish advertising in recent pay-per-view history, and finishing off with the destruction of the credibility of every major singles title in the promotion. Dave was Dave was on one on this show. He did not pissed. like this show at all.